it's in the genes. I mean, the genes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below if you like. If you like, share, subscribe. Somebody else might enjoy this video. You never know. What am I, what am I talking about? It's microchimerism. Microchimerism. Why are we doing this today? Well, the topic I had planned needs a lot more study. I just uh, came across some things I thought, hmm, so that will have to wait till its time slot next month. This topic, however, does fit in kind of nicely because it is Valentine's Day uh, coming up in a couple of days, so I can talk about relationships in our church and romance and all those sorts of things and family. And uh, this is kind of a slot, uh, you know, fill in the slot sort of message. Well, a chimera from mythology is an animal that is made up of parts of other animals. It's um, like a freak, like a monster. And so you might think about um, uh, like a centaur or something like that. You can look it up, chimera, C-H-I-M-E-R-A or some similar related spelling. Microchimerism or uh, microchimer, yeah, I guess you'd, that's close enough. <laughs> I'll probably pronounce this wrong in this little talk, is a, is a topic or is the discussion or understanding of, I'm looking for words here, the, um, the condition wherein genetic material from a child exists in the mother over extended periods of time and other sort of related things. What am I talking about? That sounds amazing. Well, let's just think about a family that has a father and a mother and three children. The first child, when the first child is born, the child has, which is pretty obvious to all of us, genetic material from the father and the mother. What is not obvious, but is a reasonable, reasonably recent discovery, is that the mother keeps in her body cells from the first child for possibly her entire life. Now, if she's doing that and keeping cells from the first child, that means by extension, she's keeping genetic material also from the father of the first child in her body, which is interesting. Now, extend this. It's, we also know that the mother, let's assume now that the, that child has a sibling, there's a, a, a baby born afterwards, that second child has, has genetic material from the mother and the father and the older sibling in its body. Now, that's really fascinating. That's this idea of chimerism, that is, I'm carrying genetic material from, uh, from an other being in myself. How long does that stay? As far as we know, it stays for life, but there are some questions about that. And so this is really fascinating. Now let's add another sibling to this. The third child carries genetic material from the mother and the father, and the second child, and the first one, which is, again, really interesting. Wow. This is something that most people don't really have, have never really heard of, and it's a topic that I share when I do uh, pre-marriage discussions with children, with children, with people who are planning to have children, even if not, sometimes we talk about it. We talk about this connectivity. And in blended families, it's interesting because you, have, you can have this connectivity stream from uh, multiple sets of adults, and that's also a real interesting thing. Now, do we know why this was there or what happened or whatever or for what purpose? I don't think we know everything, but we have some pretty good ideas. These genetic things seem to bond us and seem to allow us to communicate and to be aware of our siblings in a very interesting way. Now, further work has been done in this topic in, where um, children have been aborted prior to the, prior to the birth of, um, uh, of later siblings. And they found that the later siblings often will, re will have a sense of a missing sibling. Someone should be at the table. That's very interesting, isn't it? And the mother, of course, still carries genetic material from that child that no longer exists. I am not aware, now possibly somebody can, out there can find information about this, I'm not aware if the same thing occurs with um, uh, babies that have been lost during pregnancy or whatever, I, I don't know. Uh, nevertheless, it's a very, very broad field. And uh, microchimerism is known and studied amongst mammals. I don't know if it's been studied amongst other, uh, other creatures at all, but of course, um, yeah, who knows? And it's really just a marvelous thing. Now, this connectivity is something that bonds us and links us together. 
in a really special way. When, you know, when I first heard about the fact that the mother perpetually carries all of the, you know, cellular memories of all of her children, and of course every time of the father of those children as well, it really got me thinking about this connectivity thing and how connected we are. Now, this, these connections go much further probably than we're ever aware. There have been studies done with um, uh, observing animals when their, their siblings in remote places have died and seeing how those animals have changed. The Russians did some work on that in the 60s and 70s. I think it's been done probably everywhere in the world. And it's, it's just really, really amazing. Now, um, if you push this thing just a little bit farther, you say, well, would there be any biological reasons for this? Are there things that maybe we do or know or we have studied or whatever? Well, there has been work done uh, regarding whether or not, not good English there, but work done about whether a child can recognize its mother over and against many other women. This isn't like a, a three or four year old that can recognize by facial features, but like talking about a baby and maybe by the smell or whatever. And the studies have found that the a baby can tell by the smell of its, uh, of, you know, by the smell of which woman is its mother. And they did that by passing multiple lactating women uh, close to babies and finding out the baby would react to its own mother, but not so much to any others. And that's really, really amazing. Now, our sense of smell as we become adults tends to degrade a little bit. We, we, don't, um, we don't experience that kind of ability. Nevertheless, the children do. Now, further to this, the question was asked, how about fathers? Does a child connect to the biological father in a way that we don't understand or whatever? And it was discovered that children do not sense or are not connected to their biological father by uh, smell like they are with the mother, and that could be the milk of the mother or whatever, who knows, not so much by smell, but by the touch. They were, they were able to determine that the touch of the back of the hand was enough for a baby to know this is my father and this is not my father. And that says so much to us about our desire to bond and our need to bond and, and how important the family is. And, uh, and, and it's, it, it just gets you thinking about you know, the greatness of God and the, and, and the depth of his plans and how we're all connected together and, and so on. Now, further to this, Work has been done that has assumed or has looked for relationships between that biological material and health and or sickness. And it's found in some cases, some, some theorize that this may be one of the reasons for autoimmune diseases or so on. That's the possible work that's been done on that. Who knows? There's a lot to be said. You can look up microchimerism on the internet and see a large number of articles about this topic. So it's very well known. I'm not off in some conspiracy land getting something you know that no one knows about. But another side of this, and when I first heard about this topic in 2013, and I sort of read casually about it the whole time, uh, there is a strong belief that using and isolating those cells that might be in the mother could be used to treat diseases in the children and vice versa. Picking um, mother cells, um, those sort of sibling cells in the child, could possibly be used to treat mothers of diseases. So this is like a brand new, this is, I don't know, brand new, but it's really undiscovered country in, in terms of our relationships with one another. Now, can this area of microchimerism, can microchimerism exist or begin as a result of non-natural means? So we, we're talking here about natural means, a biological father, a biological uh, mother, producing biological children. We have that sort of connection in our head from my conversation now with you. It has uh, been discovered that there are two, and I think probably more, conditions wherein microchimerism can exist that are non-natural. And one is with blood transfusion. So blood that's taken from somebody else can create a condition where, it, where that person's cells persist for a very long time. Now, I don't know how long, but it does it just give, gives you that sort of hmm feeling about that. The other one is reasonably obvious, and that would be organ transplantation. And uh, think about this, that you've, you've brought in not just a bit of blood, but an organ that has to function for the rest of your life. You, the person may, may have to take drugs so as not to reject the organ. Nevertheless, we've got cells from some other being now in our body. It's what is this doing? What's it causing? Who knows? And the who knows is really the question. 
The other thing we have to probably think about is a lot of our injected drugs and materials that are built based on other diseases or based on um, uh, extracted from other creatures, other animals, ending up in our system in a way that normally they would not, that is by injection. What happens there? Do, do, do those cells exist in our body for long periods of time causing damage or causing whatever? All these things need to be considered. However, we want to go back now to the, uh, to the natural um, uh, microchimerism discussion just very quickly before I close off. And remember, this is just, just that little segment. If you like this topic and you want me to do more on it, let me know because I've got quite a library and, and had um, done a lot of reading and I think you'll find this to be really fascinating. Think about now this, this couple that is holding their first child. They've got this child in hand and they realize that this child is 50% approximately DNA of the father, 50% of the mother, and that's kind of obvious, but that the mother then now knows that this child is with her in more than an emotional way, in a physical, biological way. She also knows, as a result of having this child, that, her, that the father of the child is with her also in a biological way because she retains those cells for many, many years and, and maybe for life. So it's not really, really fascinating. Now, then the second child comes along in the third. Now, you know, th this is a, is a really strong um, kind of indicator or a really strong suggester of how valuable it is to, um, to reinforce inter-sibling relationships. And really, it's a good tool for, for teaching and instructing siblings as, as to, you know, that, that they're really part of this family, this genetic connection, this string. Also, it's helpful, and I found this to be helpful in, uh, in, in, in um, talking to families, young families that are blending and helping them understand some of the dynamics of the siblings and so on. See, the more we know, the more we understand, the better life becomes, doesn't it? And, and realizing that the, that the siblings, um, are, 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 they may be raised together, maybe whatever, but they may not be but not biologically related, this may have some impact. And once you know it and you understand it well, you can better deal with whatever's coming along. This is fascinating. This human touch thing with the father speaks so strongly to me as a father. Your, uh, your relationship with your children, the fact that they need to be around you, they need that constant contact. And, and we, we look today at a society, particularly young men, but also young women who, who have been raised without fathers, paying an enormous price, can't relate to the world, and, can't, and, and, and struggle very, very deeply on a really deep level. So these things really help us to think. They help us to think about the wonder of families. They help us to think about the wonder of, of relationships between men and women and children and our wonderful interconnect. How often have I used the word, the, the word wonderful? And truly, I have done a pre-marriage work with couples have no religious background at all. I've talked about this. And it's like they go, wow. That's just amazing. And I hope that it helps them better to bond with their children and to build better connections with their children. Is this field growing? Well, it's not, the knowledge of this is not growing as fast as I would like. I think a lot more work needs to be done on this. Maybe it is, maybe there's people studying it elsewhere. I don't know. Are there a lot of articles on it? Yes. Is it a biblical topic? Well, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's one of these things that every time I talk about it in front of my congregation, I get this same sense of wow, the same sense of wonder. And so I'm just sharing this with you as we're approaching Valentine's Day. And we just want to be reminded of how linked we are together. It is, um, it's in the genes. I mean, the genes, the genetics. My name is Al Persson. Come back again next week for a further discussion on a different topic. If you like this one, let me know and I'll see what I can do going forward.